Okay, thanks very much. And uh, uh, I have the happy task today of introducing uh, uh, Dr. Kendall R. Phillips, who is Professor of Communication and Rhetorical Studies at Syracuse University. His research focuses on the intersection between politics and popular culture with particular attention to horror cinema. He has published several books on, on horror films, uh, which I will dutifully wave in front of the, uh, in front of my webcam now, including Projected Fears, Horror Films in American Culture, Place of Darkness, The Rhetoric of Horror in Early American Cinema, and most recently, A Cinema of Hopelessness, The Rhetoric of Rage in 21st century popular, uh, 21st century popular culture, which I do not have at hand. Um, so take it away, Kendall. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Murray. I really appreciate it. Now is the 15 minutes where we see if the old man can figure out how to uh, share his screen. So we'll see if, uh, you know, you think two years into this, I should have learned how to do this, but Murray, am I, am I doing, am I doing it? You appear to be. Okay, tell me if I actually get to the part where you see only the big screen. Did I do it? That, you've got it. Yay, Correct. you can teach a very old dog new tricks. Anyway, first of all, thank you, Murray. I, I was so happy to hear that Murray would be chairing. He is not only one of the best scholars in the field that I know, an encyclopedic brain that seems to know everything, but also like the most lovely, gracious human being I have ever met. So I'm always feel better if Murray's in the room. I just feel a little safer knowing he's nearby. I also wanna thank uh, Craig and Chris and all the amazing folks at Fear 2000. I have desperately wanted to come. We've sent graduate students. I, I've, I've planned every year to come. So to have the chance to be invited is, is super uh, exciting. Uh, I'd also say thanks to all of what I'll call the invisible labor. I've, I've put on some events of this magnitude. And so I know the number of students, post-grad students, administrative staff, tech people, friends, partners, family who are rallying around the cause to make this happen. So my deep gratitude to all of them. And the last thing I just say quickly is, is congratulations. Um, I was able to see uh, some of the very early panels this morning. They were amazing, uh, humbling, uh, super incredible, great scholarship. And I think it's a, it's a testament to the hard work of the folks at Sheffield Hallam University. But also if I could be allowed one editorial comment, I think it's just a wonderful testament to the growth of horror studies. I have been uh, scribbling around these parts for the better part of 20 years. Uh, and to see the incredible growth in horror studies, not only in terms of the number of people and the quality of scholarship, the diversity of perspectives and backgrounds and ideas, but the growth of community. And that is not accidental. That is folks like uh, Craig and Chris and the folks at Sheffield, the Johnny Walker and that group uh, doing the work at, about exploitation, the, the great work going on at Pittsburgh with the Romero Center, the amazing leadership of SCMS's Horror SIG. So uh, if I'm allowed one editorial comment, I wanna say how exciting it is to see this community really developing, to learn from all of you. And as an old person on the edge of that community, I am, I am warming myself on the fire uh, of your brilliance. Um, so uh, to get to the talk, uh, I think like a lot of Americans uh, and probably much of the globe, uh, I find myself the last week or so really thinking about uh, September 11th, 2001, uh, uh, particularly as we approach the 20th anniversary of that uh, horrible moment uh, tomorrow. And I think one of the things I, I find myself puzzling over uh, is the way that this kind of wave of anger and violence that emerged out of the US and I would say a lot of the West towards the rest of the world after that event has really shifted. And so that same wave of rage and anger and violence that was once aimed outward seems to have turned inward towards the structures of governance within the United States. And so I guess I'm puzzling over this transformation uh, from post 9-11's militant patriotism that called Americans to rally around the flag and their government into a rabid anti-government sentiment that led an angry mob of those same Americans to murder a U.S. Capitol police officer and storm into the halls of the federal government. So in my presentation today, I want to try to trace the circulation of the affect of rage, 
through to borrow the felicitous phrase from Sarah Ahmed, our affective economy. Now by this term, as you all probably know better than I do, she means the complex networks through which shared feelings move through the social body, align individuals with community and create a shared sense of the world. So in what follows, I wanna think about how films become part of that, particularly horror films, uh, part of this affective economy, how they work to circulate feelings and invite audiences to share not only certain feelings, but certain orientations Orientations by structuring affect within their narratives and visuals. I, I want to do this by looking at the media texts of the Purge franchise. Uh, the Purge franchise, I think, is actually particularly interesting and maybe a little bit unique. Uh, it's one of really only a small number of horror franchises that have been, so three things here, first, successful at the box office. And these are five films of gross 328 million, domestic 532 global on a combined budget of just over $50 million. So they've been successful. Uh, they've been primarily under the control of a single filmmaker, James DeMonico, who wrote all five films, directed the first three. And I would say all five films have been interested in political critique. And here I'll cite no, no, none other than the amazing Stacey Abbott, uh, who in her incredibly insightful analysis of the Purge franchise argues that while the series can be at times a bit formulaic, and as she says, uh, aimed at a mass audience, they nevertheless offer social commentary and moral nuance alongside high octane action and jump scares. Uh, and indeed, I think the only other franchise that comes close to this is maybe Romero's Dead Trilogy, although Romero's Dead Trilogy, as most of you know, was A, not always successful at the box office, but also spaced out over decades. So Romero in the 60s and in the 70s, the 80s, the 2000s, whereas DeMonico's films have followed the contours of America's changing political tone and affect over the period of just eight years. And those were, I don't need to remind us, particularly volatile eight years that saw the end of the Obama era and the rise and then fall of the Trump presidency. So in what follows, I want to trace the movement of the affect of rage through the films and related media texts of the franchise. I'll do this by first examining a little bit in more detail, the initial uh, entry, 2013's The Purge, and its relationship that I find between some of the social protests, particularly around the Occupy Wall Street movement, in the second section of the talk, I want to very quickly stair step through the other four films to look at how this affective echo shifted and transformed in relation to the dynamic changes in American political culture in the period that saw the rise of Donald Trump to the nation's uh, highest office. And in my absolute concluding remarks, because I promised Craig I would talk about transmediality, I intend to examine the way this affective echo begins to work in, and is amplified through the transmedial nature of the franchise, considering, for instance, its presence on television and social media. So if September 11th was the event that unleashed this wave of kind of militant, violent, xenophobic rage across and out and from the United States, and of course was picked up by a lot of other countries in the West and global North, I wanna suggest that one crucial inflection point where those feelings of anger and frustration and fear were redirected inward occurred in 2011 in New York City's Zuccotti Park in the form of the Occupy Wall Street movement. What began as a protest on Wall Street was, if those of you will remember, quickly replicated across uh, cities across the country and indeed around the globe, and then became kind of connected in interesting ways with similarly framed protests in uprisings in Tunisia and Lebanon and Egypt, I think also in the Brexit movement and probably also in the American Tea Party. Now, it's tempting to want to obscure all of these individual efforts by seeing them as part of one single movement. But I want to avoid this temptation and suggest that instead of thinking as Occupy and these other related uh, uh, moments, uh, issues uh, as movement, instead we think of them as responding to a powerful moment. Uh, indeed, WJT Mitchell posits that Occupy might be thought of not as a movement, but as a revolutionary moment with all the associated ambiguities of the merely momentary and, and ephemeral, alongside a sense of a kind of momentous turning point in culture. So following Mitchell's sense of occupy as moment rather than movement, I wanna trace some of the ways this powerful moment echoed through American popular culture in the years following occupy by using DeMonico's The Purge as a prime of example of what I call post-occupy cinema. So in the interest of time, I will not uh, delve too deeply into the complicated uh, aspects of the Occupy movement and its political rhetoric. And instead, I will ask your gracious permission to simply stipulate what I think are three 
fairly obvious and powerful orientations to how Occupy invited people to feel. Uh, the first of those was that Occupy was very much focused on the evil of the system. Now, the system is a necessarily vague and ambiguous concept that includes broad structures of political, social, economic governance. But in Occupy, that system was irredeemably evil. It was not to be reformed. It could not be saved. It was in and of itself entirely, fundamentally, irredeemably evil. Second, if you buy Occupy's uh, message that these systems of late capitalism, global governance, et cetera, are evil, then the only option is the audacity of simply refusing to be part of the system. And indeed, much of what Occupy was defined by was its unwillingness to engage in politics or reform or putting forward a new message because it simply refused to be part of the system. Now, of course, if we see an evil system and we simply refuse to engage it, we refuse to be part of it, we are left with a very uncertain future. And that is the uncertainty of what would remain. And indeed, uh, this was part of the problem, of course, of the Occupy movement is that once the Occupy movement was over, people said, well, they didn't do anything. Well, I, I challenge that and I can have that conversation uh, in, the, in the chat afterwards. Because one of the things I think Occupy did do was unleash this feeling of anger and rage toward the system. It changed some of the language, it changed some of the visuals as it affected the affective economy within the country. Um, so my focus here is on DeMonico's film, The Purge, but I just wanna observe briefly that this post-occupied tendency I'm talking about, I think is pretty obviously evident in other films. So in the longer chapter of the forthcoming uh, project that Murray was nice enough to mention, uh, Cinema of Hopelessness, from which I'm drawing the very first part of this analysis, I also examined Joss Whedon's Cabin in the Woods, Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer, and also gesture towards like some of the many popular YA films like Hunger Games, Maze Runner, et cetera. So to the topic at hand, as a brief reminder, The Purge was a relatively low budget home invasion film set in a future America in which social stability has been maintained by an annual 12 hour period, the titular purge, in which all crime is legal. The initial film revolves around a single uh, middle class, upper middle class white family who find themselves suddenly the target of an angry gang of vicious killers who invade their home on this one lawless night. Now that the purge emphasizes the evil of the system seems fairly obvious, right? The titular purge is a government run and sponsored program that seeks to unleash social ills through a period of wanton lawlessness. Now, such a brutal system is not, to be clear, unprecedented. One could think of films like Rollerball or Soylent Green or The Running Man or any number of others. But what I think is notable here is the banality by which evil is introduced in the film. In the film's opening title sequence, we're informed that America has entered an idyllic future phase, low unemployment, virtually no crime. The basis of this is the purge. And the national mantra is, blessed be the new founding fathers for letting us purge and cleansing our souls. Blessed be America, a nation reborn. The film itself opens into this kind of very banal everyday uh, future as the suburban Sandin family begins preparations for the annual purge. I find it interesting that people decorate their homes with blue flowers to indicate their support of this national holiday. And every July 4th, America is full of lots of decorations about our national holiday. And so what I want to point out is that the degree to which the purge seems to be existing in a very banal everyday normal world seems to me to underscore that point made about how evil can sometimes be so routine and unremarkable, noted by Hannah Arendt when she coined the phrase, the banality of evil. Of course, the brutality of the New Founding Fathers system is presented in the film as a necessary evil for stability. This is, again, part of that systemic critique. Jim Sandin, the father of the Sandin family, explains to his young son, who asks, why do we have this purge? You don't remember how bad it was, Charlie, the poverty, the crime. This night saved our country. And here Sandin is giving voice to the lie that the film will reveal, namely that the horrors of the system are necessary to prevent an even worse fate from befalling our country. Importantly, in The Purge, those who will be subjected to horror of the system are also implicated within it. The Sandin family lives a life of comfort and privilege, in large part due to Jim Sandin's success at selling other wealthy families security systems to protect them from this annual moment of violence. Indeed, the jealousy of their neighbors is a crucial plot point later in the film when the neighbors arrive ostensibly to save the Sandin family from the angry marauding invaders, 
but we soon learn the neighbors have come not to save the Sandins, but because the neighbors want to kill the Sandins themselves. As one of the neighbors explained, you made so much money off us and then just stuck it in our face. So the precarity of their privilege and the danger of moving from one who exploits to one who is exploited is the key anxiety being echoed. And I think it fits in with that broader kind of culture of austerity that folks like our friend Craig Mann have observed circulating in a lot of the home invasion films of this period. Now, I do want to point out as I move to the question of refusal, some of the dystopian films I've looked at have pretty apocalyptic moments of dystopian uh, refusal, right? So Cabin in the Woods, those of you who know, ends with refusal of the system leading to the end of the world, right? Uh, the Persia does not have anything quite so uh, dramatic, but it does have three, I think, crucial and in ways poignant moments in which the Sandin family refuses the brutality of the system that they are part of, the rage and violence of that system. The first, of course, is that while safely ensconced in the security of their home, the Sandin's son, uh, Charlie, chooses to open up the security system to allow an apparently homeless Black man refuge from his tormentors. The second instance occurs when the father, Jim Sandin, refuses to surrender this innocent homeless man. And of course, this is what leads to the home invasion that threatens the family and ultimately costs Jim Sandin his life. For me, the most poignant moment of refusal comes near the end of the film. As noted, the marauding killers, uh, home invaders, are finally defeated by the Sandin's neighbors, who then want to kill the family themselves. This ritual slaughter, however, is thwarted when that homeless man shows up, and soon the tables are turned. And Mary Sandin is faced with the prospect of unleashing the purge violence on her neighbors, of killing them. And she refuses. Even as one of her neighbors goads her, oh, for God's sakes, just do it. Mary Sandin refuses to participate in the system of violent exploitation. We are going to play out the rest of this night, she says, in motherfucking peace. As the siren sounds to signal the end of this annual 12 hour period of the purge, the neighbors leave and the Sandins are left with their losses and the knowledge that their refusal has actually done nothing to change the system in which they live. As the nameless black homeless man uh, who both imperiled and ultimately saved them leaves, Mary Sandin calls out to him. Wait, are you going to be okay? Thank you. The met stranger looks back and replies simply, good luck. And indeed, both the Sandins and the homeless man will need luck as the system that sustains and imperils them remains and in one year's they, time, they will once again face the violence and rage of the purge. Now, the success of the purge led to four sequels. And in the next section, I will very quickly, I promise, uh, step through those films to look at the way this affective orientation towards systems of governance and order shifts across the film of the franchise with particular interest in the way these shifts respond to changing conditions in American political life. But first, a brief excursion into rudimentary acoustics from a person who really does not ever understand anything about acoustics. And Echo, you'll see on screen right, is created by a sound source creating a sound, which then bounces off an object and returns to the sender. My analogy of affective echo then is intended to use this basic idea to suggest that at moments of cultural upheaval, these moments send out an affective wave that then reflects through future texts that carry it back into the culture. Hence, the affective orientation of the Occupy moment returns to culture in slightly altered form of cinematic narratives like that of The Purge. Echoes are, I think, also a bit like other allegories in that the sound that returns to us in an echo seems separate and sometimes altered from the version of the sound we created. Hence, the echo of an affect in some cinematic text will not be immediately recognized as emanating from the event of its creation, but rather may seem somewhat altered and strange. And indeed, this sense of distance, alteration, and strangeness is arguably part of what makes some cinematic texts uh, give us space for reflection since they resemble but not are, are not identical to the anxieties and chaos that produce them. Crucially, the distance that the sound travels away from its source also helps to create not only the lag that will make the echo seem distinct from the original sound, but also the changes in sound wave that make the echo sound maybe a little bit different, a little lower, a little different in pitch than the original sound. When the distance are too short, 
and the time is too short. The echoing sound is perceived as part of the same sound. And this, of course, is reverberation. So my reading of the subsequent Purge franchise is that these films become more directly and immediately responsive to changing political conditions in the United States. The affective echo of the original film begins to change and eventually becomes something more like an affective reverb. And that the films pr are premiering almost directly into the cultural conditions they're responding to. And importantly, that the horrors displayed on the film, on the screen, become almost indistinguishable from the horrors on the contemporary real world. The sequels start with 2014's Purge Anarchy that takes place during the sixth annual Purge and largely follows along themes of the first film. And so I think kind of retains a lot of that kind of echo feel. Uh, first and foremost, where the original Purge focused on an affluent family, one of the big changes is this film focuses on uh, a working class Latino family. Our main protagonist is here, Eva, uh, who's a working class Latino waitress. As the film begins, we see her screwing up her courage uh, in hopes of asking for a raise so she can afford the medication to keep her father alive. The request is refused, and we are soon given a deep sense of the frustrations of everyday life for Eva and her family. So if the story of the Sandins was one of the invisible cost of unearned privilege, the story of anarchy emphasizes what Lauren Berlant has called cruel optimism. For Eva and her family, the only hope is to survive this lawless night of the purge and hope for something better or at least sustainable on the other side. Things, of course, not surprisingly, do not go well. Uh, having lost the last shred of his cruel optimism, Eva's father, Rico, who is older and sick, decides to sell himself as a sacrifice to a wealthy family who prefer to violently purge in the comfort of their own home. Um, Eva's night, of course, does not go much better. Uh, shortly after the beginning of the purge, her lecherous building superintendent, Diego, shoots his way into the apartment and is preparing to violate her and her daughter, Callie, before he himself becomes victim of a group of soldiers suddenly sweeping through the building. The introduction of these soldiers is revealed as part of a government operation to target poorer neighborhoods and eliminate working class citizens because evidently the violence of the purge is not creating enough victims. The introduction of the soldiers and our second main protagonist, uh, Sergeant Leo, adds a kind of action flavor to anarchy. And so if the franchise is kind of influenced by Carpenter films like uh, Assault on Precinct 13, I think this is definitely an escape from New York or maybe better yet, an escape from LA moment. Leo, Evan, uh, Eva, Callie are joined by some affluent white folks and spend most of the films navigating the dark and empty streets of Los Angeles, evading roving bands of purgers, various military units operating to increase the body count. On their journey, they encounter a number of, of really horrible scenarios, including an arena in which wealthy uh, people bid on the chance to hunt the poor. And I would point out this is a full six years before another Blumhouse production, The Hunt, would stir a major public controversy and be removed from release based on the exact same premise. Uh, the other thing Eva and uh, Leo and their compatriots find is a group of revolutionaries, a militant band armed and intent on overturning the new founding fathers and stopping the purge. So many of the post-Occupy attitudes from the first film are also evident in anarchy, notably a sense of the divide between the wealthy who are hunting and the needy who are hunted, um, as well as targeting bankers who are greedy. But where the first film leaves the source of this new brutally exploitive system a little bit ambiguous, we're not quite sure in the first purge why there's so much violence is there. Uh, the second film is very explicit about the complicity and indeed agency of the government, and this really becomes central to the plot. Uh, indeed, ag uh, the agency of the government is absolutely crucial in that there's not only promoting, but the government is perpetrating acts of violence and targeting particular groups in the community. And this actually, this theme will become prevalent in the next two uh, entries in, into the theme. This emphasis on a government conspiracy, however, always remains a little bit ambivalent, in part because of the way the menaces are presented. Um, the film goes back and forth between kind of action sequences where soldiers show up but then also more gruesome and horrifying encounters are usually being perpetrated by everyday purgers who are the ones wearing the fantastic cons, uh, costumes and wielding much more brutal weapons than assault rifles. Indeed, one of the trends that starts in this film and will kind of continue on in a couple of the other purge films is this split between antagonists, where one is the government and government troops 
and the other is usually a single terrifying menacing individual who keeps pursuing our protagonist throughout the film uh, here the the gentleman in the god uh, 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 mask in this way that I think is in terms of political message that I think really does capture America around 2014 or so is the recognition that in a democratic society, the evils and brutality of the state cannot be solely attributed to the systems of government. But in a democracy, we have to recognize that these systems are also the results of our fellow citizens who either through their passivity or their active ugly hostility are giving legitimacy to the brutality and violence of the system. This complex formulation of citizenry, state, and savagery is brought even closer to current events in the third Purge film, 2016's Purge election year. Now, this film was released on July 4th, 2016, just four months before the election that would see Donald Trump assume the presidency of the United States. And election year delves even deeper into the active involvement of the government in promoting the brutal Purge system. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, the film opens with a very terrifying, brutal uh, home invasion and torture sequence that is from one of the earlier purge moments. And we see a young woman uh, seeing her entire family kind of brutally murdered. That young woman, we learn in the film, eventually becomes a politician, Senator Charlie Roan. And we find that Senator Roan is running for the presidency against one of the new founding fathers, Minister Owen. Roan is running on an anti-purge message, and that message is starting to gain traction among American voters. And the main plot line in the film involves the government deciding that to stop Senator Rowan, they will uh, end the practice of giving political leaders immunity so that they also can be fair targets during the purge. Not surprisingly then, government forces soon target Senator Roan uh, for assassination, although she has the benefit of having the only recurring character in the Purge franchise, our good old friend, Sergeant Leo, as her head of security. Soon things go pear-shaped and Sergeant Leo is leading the Senator on a run through Washington, DC, where they soon encounter other uh, 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 imperiled locals, black bodega owner, Joe, his Latino assistant, Marcos, their friends, and unlike in anarchy, where the military forces are kind of just generic US military, here the forces pursuing our protagonists through the nightmarish streets are far right white supremacist paramilitary mercenaries, which I think adds to a growing sense of the parallel with the politics of 2016 that were unfolding at the time of the film's release. Now here it's worth noting that this film could not have been developed as a response to the Trump presidency itself. The filming on election year began in September 2015, which was just three months after Trump announced what was at the time considered an absolutely ridiculous uh, plan to run for president. So in this way, the film is not so much prescient of events as eerily connected to, I think, the feelings of frustration, white fragility, reactionary rage that were circulating in the country and that would actually lead to the election of Donald Trump. Indeed, one of the most disturbing moments in the film uh, is the parallel between the kind of furious fervor of the new founding father's supporter at the prospect of murdering their opponent, Senator Charlie Roan, and the way that that almost directly corresponds to the Trump rallies and the angry chants of lock her up that were directed against uh, his opponent, former Senator Hillary Clinton. Uh, perhaps even more unsettling is a moment in the film's conclusion that I don't think I even saw the first, I noticed the first time, but really stood out to me in rewatching it. As the news is announcing Senator Rowan's sweeping victory and her plan to immediately end the purge, the anchor begins to report. We're just now receiving reports of scattered incidents across the country where NFFA supporters are reacting violently to this defeat. They are burning cars, looting window, breaking windows, looting, and attacking police officers. Now, I don't necessarily think James DeMonaco is sentient, but I do think it suggests the way that there's a kind of qualitative shift, that the events of the purge are really starting to catch up to the waves of anger, rage, and violence that were circulating across the country. For me, the real qualitative shift that moves from a kind of altered echo of frustration and violence to a much more immediate and intense reverb of the violence occurring outside the screening happens in the films, The First Purge and The Forever Purge, the last two films in the franchise. 
both of these things, I think, are really very immediate to the sense of brutality, rage, and refusal that was circulating in the country at the time. And so by the time these films come out, arguably, the boundaries between cinematic violence and very real world uh, waves of violence and rage are largely imploding. Um, the first Purge, uh, it's worth recalling, was released in 2018 during the height of the Black Lives Matter protest against the systemic state-sponsored anti-Black violence and exploitation that still exists in the United States. The political intensity combined with the staggering success of Jordan Peele's racially conscious horror film Get Out, I think helped to set the stage. The first Purge's release, as Robin Means Coleman, Tanana Reeve Du, and others have noted, Peele's film really helped to shift the genre uh, away from treating Black characters as uh, kind of side issues, and so that they were not just those who survived the horror film, but increasingly Black, Indigenous, people of color characters became agents of action and indeed central protagonists. Notably, the first Purge's core character cast is entirely characters of color and it, all its main protagonists are black. Uh, this is also the first film not directed by James DeMonico, the helming duties I think wisely given to black director Jared McMurtry. It's also clear that the producers sought to capitalize on the connection between the political environment and the film. In this example, one of the few posters of The Purge that doesn't feature crazy masks or brutal weapons, we see a, a, an emphasis on a sequence in the film where residents protest the upcoming Purge, which I think looks very much drawn from the headlines of some of the Black Lives Matter protests. Now here it's worth recalling the dark and troubling racial presence. And I, and I don't mean to bring up some really unpleasant moments in American history, but I think it's important for us to remember that these things happened. Right? So before the first purge was released, we had a series of really horrible state-sponsored killings of black men. Uh, the police killed Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014 that led to months of unrest across the country. Freddie Gray was died while in police custody in Baltimore in 2014, leading to renewed violence. In 2016, the police shooting of Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and Philando Castile in Minneapolis, and other acts of violence sparked more than 100 Black Lives Matter protests across the country and brought professional athletes like Colin Kaepernick to bring the protest into sports stadium. The election of Trump in, 19, in 2016 only exacerbated racial unrest. The Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, we should remember, exploded into violence, leading to the tragic death of Heather Heyer and many injuries. And in April 2018, the Los Angeles Police Department shot and killed Gracharyo Mark in the middle of a shopping mall. And in June, shot and killed Kenneth Ross Jr. as he ran away from officers in Rally Park. And here I will just note, this is a tragically abbreviated version of a much, much longer list. Um, the first Purge's connection to this contemporary events, I think, is signaled in the very opening moments of the film. Uh, there's a brief prologue in which we see an interview with an angry junkie named Skeletor, who becomes our kind of main menacing, scary uh, menace, uh, and he coins the term the Purge. But immediately after that, the screen is filled from, with real news footage of things actually happening in America at that time. Uh, the 2008 stock market, housing market crash, uh, rising unemployment, Occupy Wall Street, the opioid addiction, Black Lives Matter protest, right wing racists marching with Confederate flags. And so here the fictional narrative that sees the new founding father as a chosen party of the National Rifle Association and rising to prominence really kind of blends perfectly into a political moment. In fact, the new founding father's political slogan is, we will bring our country back, which might remind some of you of another political slogan that had been circulated right around that time. For the New Founding Fathers, slipping into this very real politics in the cinematic way, their first major policy initiative of bringing our country back is an experiment with the purge. Um, the plot of the first purge parallels longstanding critiques of American systemic racism, continuing that kind of immediacy. A poor and underserved community of color here, Staten Island, is positioned as the scapegoat for the country's problems. And instead of giving them, say, support, uh, they are instead subjected to more poverty, guns, drugs, and here, state-sponsored violence. Indeed, the state sponsorship of the purge violence that had become prominent in previous installments is here depicted as the core motivation for the policy of the purge. Indeed, when residents of Staten Island choose not to unleash violence, but instead have a little bit of looting at a big wild block party, the government sends in outsiders, 
uh, white supremacists and mercenaries who begin to perpetrate violence against the residents who are then blamed for the violence that is being committed against them. Now, the need to keep these outsiders anonymous is why they wear masks, which then becomes the central visual motif in other films. For me, the introduction of these external forces provides some of the most disturbing images in the film. Uh, Ku Klux Klan members riding on trucks through the streets of a black neighborhood. Persians dressed in police uniforms, beating to death a black man in a baseball stadium. And for me, the most disturbing, the image of white supremacists leaving a community church covered in the blood of congregants, recalling quite vividly the murder of black parishioners of Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015 by, uh, by Dylan Roof. Now, while sombering and politically unsettling in its imagery, the first purge strikes a kind of defiant tone by the end, if not entirely optimistic. Our main protagonist, the community organizer, Naya, her brother, Aaron, and Dimitri, the drug kingpin who re relearns his love of community, they survive the night of barbarity. And as they're walking away with other survivors in an image that bears striking resemblance to Black Lives Matter protest, someone says, what do we do now? Dimitri responds with the rallying cry that motivated so many real life protests, calling out the system of exploitation and injustice in the US. He says, we fight. So I, as I've tried to sketch briefly here, the feelings of terror and outrage enacted on the screen during the first purge are very much contemporaneous with the exact same feelings and indeed images circulating in 2018, the middle of the Trump presidency. Uh, and an era in which the nation's chief executive said some of the white supremacists in Charlottesville were good people. If this sense of affective reverb evident in the first purge is evident, I think it becomes absolutely palpable in 2021's The Forever Purge. This film picks up after the events of election year with that film's happy ending with President Roan ending the purge summarily dismissed. President Roan's administration, we learn, has lost re-election, and the returning new founding fathers have reinstated the annual purge. Now, some of you may think that's just lazy script writing, but I will attest, for Americans who were shocked by the surprise upset of Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election, and the speed with which many progressive core policies could be abandoned and gutted and the tone of American politics turn on a dime, the speed with which the purge was reinstated felt unsettlingly familiar. Even more disturbing was this film's main conceit that a large portion of the American population had been secretly conspiring to ignore the end of the annual purge and engage in what they call the forever after purge, a right-wing racist uprising designed to purify the country of those deemed non-American. Um, this purge purification force soon overtakes the country and our protagonist, a trio of Mexican immigrants, a white rancher, his pregnant wife and his sister soon must make their way through the streets and roads of South Texas on their way to the Mexican border, since Mexico is now the safe place granting immunity to American refugees. And I think earlier there was a wonderful talk about From Dust Till Dawn. I don't remember the author, so I apologize, but it was great about talking about that space as a borderland of possibility. And I think that trope is reenacted here in quite interesting ways. The parallels to the January 6th insurrection that saw a violent mob of Trump supporters break into the US Capitol building uh, is, is disturbing. More surprising is the way that the film had been completed, again presciently, in February of 2020, a full eight months before Americans went to the polls to remove Donald Trump from office, and 11 months before the violent uprising in DC. Now again, I don't think DeMonico has prophetic powers, um, but I do think it's clear that the purge has really picked up on and is reverberating with those emotions that are circulating, those emotions of rage and outrage and violent refusal of the very systems of social, governmental, and communal life. In the forever purge, as in the very real 21st century, it would seem that the rage stoked by right-wing political rhetoric can, in fact, burst into flames and those not be so easily controlled or contained by those in power. Now, I'd point out, I am not the first person to observe the similarities between the films, but I will say, as outlandish as the dystopian ending may seem, when you walk out of the film, 
and the images of the trucks full of purgers in the film look almost identical to the same pickup trucks parked in the parking lot, uh, you begin to feel that these images and motifs are no longer a distant echo, but are very much immediate and real. Now, I should point out that many critics did not like this aspect of the purge. There were a lot of condemnation that the purge was predictable. It was preachy. It was just giving us the same message. As an example, uh, fittingly writing in Texas Monthly, critic Kat Cardenas says, it seems fitting that the first anti, uh, first post-Trump film satirizing Trumpism would be a purge film. But ultimately, she notes, Watching the film's coordinated militias who turn against law enforcement and military to pursue their native's agenda feels bleak and disturbingly familiar. This is, I want to suggest, one of the potential pitfalls of the shift from affective echo to affective reverb uh, is that it's harder and harder to feel a space of reflection when the violent images of rage and revolution are so immediate and so accurate, there's almost no space for reflection and consideration. My last minutes with you, I will turn, as I promised to Craig, uh, to the transmedial, uh, because I'm a man of my word and I do what I say. And in some ways, I would say, I think the entirety of this talk has been about transmediality. Indeed, I would argue that to say affect is to have to engage in questions of transmediality, because affects do not circulate, circulate through single channels. And throughout this talk, I've looked at, I hope, the movement of images, themes, motifs, and feelings as they move between news reports and films and culture and pop culture in and around the fictional world of The Purge. But of course, in the, especially in the post-Marvel pop culture universe, we are always going to have more than just one channel uh, for any cinematic space. And that is certainly the case for the dystopian world of The Purge. And here I'd note that the various transmedial efforts, both on television and social media and other ways, have sought to further blur the boundary between the cinematic dystopia and the world of the purge. Very briefly, uh, in their effort to promote the very first purge, uh, Universal and Blumhouse launched a social media campaign around the hashtag survive the night, asking potential audience members how they would survive a real knife purge night. And Twitter users quickly took up this hashtag, not only to discuss the film, but also to talk about uh, social unrest and like the 2013 government shutdown. So audiences were already seeing survive the night as a kind of immediate political moment. Uh, for the 2018 film Purge Anarchy, the studio rolled out a traveling haunted house experience, the Purge Breakout, an immersive escape room style attraction that asked audiences to engage in the reality of how they would survive the night. The blurring between politics of the real world, the politics of Purge uh, was beautifully accentuated in a clever campaign that took the motif of an, a campaign, political campaign advertisement, but instead of voters saying, I voted, they say, I purged. Um, and finally, the television show that I wish I had more time to talk about, and certainly I'll, I'll look forward to hearing folks who watched it, their thoughts, uh, really focused on this, not only by bringing the Purge narrative into people's uh, living rooms and by exploring the kind of broader world of the, world of the Purge, but by really maximizing use of their websites for things like the Purge Mass Creator, the uh, Purge uh, Shopping Network, where you could buy a program Couch to Purge, and a cleaning product called Purge Away that helps get all those nasty blood stains out. And my favorite is an iOS Android game called The Purge Augmented Reality, where, uh, where audience and fans can set up a barricade in their actual house and then be rated on how effective it would be to stop the purge. So for me, all of these transmedial channels continue this work of shifting from affective echo to reverb by asking audiences to think about what the real life purge would be like, even though in many instances, if they want to know what the purge looks like, they have only to watch the nightly news. So in conclusion, the proliferation of media channels through which to experience the narrative of the purge, I want to be clear, I'm not saying are in any way to blame for the spiral of unrest, protest, and violence. Rather, I'm trying to suggest that looking at the franchise and its various transmedial iterations is a way to map the feelings of rage and the affects of violence that have been circulating in and around the United States and become increasingly directed towards the social structures. My final word, I want to quote uh, the American rhetorical critic Kenneth Burke. Kenneth Burke once described literature as symbolic equipment for living in the world. Now, I'll simply end by saying if the same can be said of cinema, particularly horror, horror cinema, I think we're left to ponder the question, what kind of world is the purge equipping us to live in and how do we survive?
Thank you very much, uh, Kendall. That was wonderful, uh, very stimulating, and I'm sure lots of questions uh, are going to uh, going to come at us. Um, uh, and uh, very entertaining talk as well. Uh, so at this point, I would uh, encourage people to put their questions in the chat, and I will, um, and it, with an indication of whether you'd like to read them out or whether you'd like me to convey them. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure there are many of you out there who have They're many stupefied. fine questions. They're stupefied. But I'll say this: I apologize. <laughs> I know I speak quickly. When I was younger, the first time I gave a talk in England, um, I, I spoke even faster. And at the end, someone said, "That was amazing." And I said, "Oh, thank you." And they go, "No, I didn't realize a person could speak that quickly." So I do apologize uh, if my rate was uh, was excessive. I, I I would try to control it, but I'm not very good at controlling myself. So. You know, it doesn't bother me. I usually listen to podcasts and things like that on double time just to, for the sake of efficiency, but I don't think it would work with you, Kendall. Maybe just while people, ah, pardon me. Uh, we have a question from, from Benny. Uh, perhaps you'd like to go ahead and ask it. Uh, yes, hi there. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, fairly terrifying, um, but a, a really good talk. So uh, thank you. Um, just a quick one. Um, at a time when uh, anti-nationalist or anti-capitalist uh, themes still come up in popular uh, media as the motivating ideology for bad guys, thinking about um, uh, the flag smashes in Falcon and Winter Soldier very recently, what is it about horror, um, perhaps specifically low budget horror, that means that such uh, strong anti-capitalist messaging could appear so consistently in a popular franchise and go, as far as I'm aware, relatively unchallenged uh, or undiscussed in terms of its actual politics? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, and I would note, and again, this is part of the, the, not to plug the book, but if you, if you, I don't buy the book, it's too expensive, but if you get a library to buy it, then, then you can look at the shit and then you can laugh and feel better about yourself. But um, I do think, you know, it's, it's interesting if I go back to, to, you know, iconic old texts like Andrew Tudor's, you know, Monsters and Mad Scientists, and he makes the really brilliant point of the shift from the kind of horror of security where the threat was to the system to a paranoid where the system isn't going to protect us. I think we're seeing the kind of next evolution of that. And Jeffrey Wine stock has written about this so i won't pretend like i'm some super guy who figured this out uh, but the shift to like the systemic evil and so you think about like all of i think the haunted house films that have been resurgent are kind of like the space that's supposed to keep us safe uh, is doing that and i think when it's done well and i think the purge does it well it asks us to reflect on i, I think similar in the ways to the saw films what are we willing to do to stay alive and here that shift from the saw torture porn into this is starting to ask us what are we willing to tolerate to stay alive and so i the purge i think is an interesting version for me the more interesting versions that i talk about in that longer chapter are cabin in the woods where the decision is like if this is it screw it and then whoosh, all, whoosh, there you go i reenacted the end of the, the cabin in the woods uh we're all gone or uh bong joon ho's snow piercer which is a little more optimistic but if you've seen that you know at the end the train sorry to spoiler alert the train crashes uh and as far as we know, maybe they're not going to survive, but there is in the distance a polar bear. So there's the possibility of survival. So I do feel like some of these horror films are challenging us to think about that. I think the, I won't say the problem, the change in the purge is the moment that their dystopian threat is happening. And that makes it a little bit harder, I think, to work in that for me, horror has to kind of violate our sense of the world, right? There's a moment where the, you know, the statue moves and we go, holy shit, right? right? Or the house talks and we go, nope, that's not supposed to happen. I walked out of the Forever Purge and thought, that actually doesn't seem that, like, I honestly don't think we're far from that. Oh, to highlight something. So, I don't know if that helped answer the question, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a really thoughtful question. Uh, so there was a comment here from Rocky about the parallel series that comes to mind in conjunction with the purges, the crazies, similar tropes, politically forward, it just doesn't end. I, I, I guess that that's maybe something you can chew on as well. Yeah, I mean, I do think, I think there's a lot of parallel with, I think the crazies, absolutely, uh, as well as some versions of the zombie narrative. Um, and in fact, in, in the chapter I allude, I think Rocky was actually where I first gave this talk. So hi, Rocky, good to see you again. Uh, I had, a hor I had a really horrible talk I gave at Butler, and I think, so Rocky, I, I appreciate the question. Um, but I think, you know, film, like television shows like The Walking Dead kind of play out this dystopian stuff as well. Although, again, interestingly, if you look at like the arcs of The Walking Dead, 
they aren't ever really trying to create community. Most of it is actually trying to resist community, right? So it's the governor or it's Negan or it's the whisperers. Like it's every time, and now if people are still watching The Walking Dead, it's the Commonwealth. Every time there is a system of governance, the, the protagonists of the, of, of the Walking Dead want to push it away. And, and I think that is kind of that ambivalence between the desire for social order and community and the fear of social order and community. What I think has changed in, in things like uh, The Purge and others is that there is almost no hope in community. Like we almost have no hope in each other. That's very interesting. Uh, I wonder if you know of a Canadian film called Red Letter Day. Uh, it, it borrows a bit from, uh, it comes from Calgary, my hometown. I know the director slightly. Uh, I could probably, uh, I, I could probably get it to you if there's no other way. Uh, and it's, it's, it's an interesting one because it, it's sort of a Canadian low budget variation on the same idea where everybody's being sent letters saying you have to kill this person or they'll kill you. And so the optimal scenario is that no party does this, that everybody just sits around, oh, but then there's the danger that the other person is going to do it. So you might want to get them first and, and so on. So it plays with the same ideas in a slightly different way and takes place in, in the suburbs of Calgary. Nice. Uh, do you know what year that came out? It was a few years ago, like 2019 or something like that. Um, okay. very, very kind of also reminds me of that. Editor. <laughs> yeah, some of the people may have seen the, another kind of low budget film called Series 7. That's like a reality mm -hmm. show where people have yeah. to kill each other. So I, I definitely think, I think, and I will say also, I should make the apology that I forgot to make. I, I am very much focused on North American culture and particularly American culture. Um, and so I, I do recognize that some of these narratives get played out in very interesting different ways uh, in other countries. I, I thought, for instance, uh, when I was doing this project about the Wandering Earth, this uh, the big budget, budget sort of dystopian Chinese film, which has a very different attitude towards community and systems. So I don't want to pretend that the American uh, version is the only version. I will note that it still is having a disproportionate impact on the rest of the planet. Uh, and so, you know, th that's why I tend to still focus on the U.S. culture. But I, I will look that up, Maria. I'm always fascinated to see how these tropes get played out in diff slightly different cultural flames. And I know that Canada is a totally different country. Um, so we have a question here from Mark Richard Adams. Uh, I guess I'll just read it out. Considering election year features a female politician out to create change and ends with a more hopeful look to the future, it seems it was very much trying to preemptively ride on a cultural shift towards optimism that never came. What do you think of this and do following uh, sequels direct, uh, directly respond to the shock election of Trump? Uh, this makes me think of like a kid's book that, that I have and it's, it's like about inspiring women and there's like Hillary Clinton and, and it's like, you know, I think this might've come out with the presumption that she would be elected. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I actually, uh, yeah, I, I think it might have. I would say in the longer paper, and, I, and I'll and I'll blame Craig for this. When, when I wrote like a hundred pages, and then I had to cut it all down, uh, so I really needed four hours because you clearly would all want to listen to me for four hours. Um, but in the longer version, I did sort of think a little bit about this. In part, um, I do think clearly the the blonde-haired, optimistic woman. Some parallels to Hillary, I think actually closer parallels to Barack Obama's campaign. That's why I think it's still an echo. This is, and, and again, even the Republican NFFA party is like more of a 1990s, early 2000s, like the evangelical Christians. Uh, and where I think it's interesting though, is there's also a kind of reverse of that in that Hillary Rodham Clinton was very much an establishment candidate. She had been first lady, she had been senator, she had been secretary of state. She was riding on the better together stay with the system. And it was actually Donald Trump that ran as the kind of rebellious revolutionary figure. I mean, people talked about his election was throwing a Molotov cocktail into the system. So I do think like there's a kind of ambiguous, I think the tension is there between stability of the system and wanting a radical change, but the sides are actually reversed. And that's what makes, I think, the political ambivalence of election year uh, different. I do think when you get to the first purge and certainly the forever after, now they are fully Trump. Those are clearly Trump-oriented films. And I, I agree with uh, Kat Cardenas that the purge, I think, is the first serious satire of the Trump era in the post-Trump era. Whether it's successful or not, I think we're still trying to figure that out. So it's very interesting as, as a franchise that's had to exist through several times and to to adjust to those those times almost almost on the fly. Yeah, and I think Mary, Mary you and others who are who are much more knowledgeable than I will be could maybe think of series, but I, I mean, there are certainly a lot of franchises that produce film after film after film. 
I don't know that they're always, you know, super successful. I also don't know that they're always particularly like politically oriented. So I think of like, you know, mm -hmm. some of the Halloween, uh, nothing against the Halloween sequels, but you know, when you get to the Mark of Cain and stuff, it starts to kind of go off. But I don't know of many films that are franchises that are so concentrated in such a short period and so kind of immediately politically engaged as The Purge. I, I just can't think, uh, Romero is the only one I could think of. And that again is decade after decade after decade. So I don't know those, that intensity of political, that immediacy of focus on political critique. I, I, I can't name one that, that rises to that level for me. But, but Murray, you know everything, so. Well, no, nothing comes right to my mind. I mean, uh, uh, when I think about like how some of the Star Trek films are immediately political, like Star Trek VI with the fall of communism and then then the, the post 9-11 thing that's going on and into darkness. But th those are kind of the exceptions rather than the rule, right? You know, they're sort of outliers for various reasons. Um, but anyway, let's get back to the questions that are here. Um, so Cr Craig says something interesting, he sa says, was reading an interview with David Gordon Green and Danny McBride recently in which they say that even the forthcoming Halloween kills has ended up having a connection with a capital attack in January, one that wasn't necessarily intended, but one that they think is, is, uh, is there, given the film is about Haddonfield trying to turn mob justice on Michael Myers. Um, I'm, I'm going to be really interested to see this film, I, I must say. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what they do. And I do think, I think it will become interesting to see as, again, now, I mean, again, what's interesting about The Purge is it's kind of anticipating these moments. And I think that's why it's interestingly tapped in to the feelings. And again, I don't think DeMonico is psychic or, or, or Gout or, or McMurray. I do think it's just that they have picked up and are riding this wave of anger. It will be interesting to, for me to see now post-January 6th films like Halloween Kills and others responding to that moment. And if they're able to create that kind of distance and alteration, or if it just ends up feeling like that re reverberation chamber where it's like, everything's right here. So I'm, I'm fascinated to see what, I will say I'm not particularly optimistic, but I never am, so. Uh, so we're, we're getting close to 11.40, but I'm told we can go five to 10 minutes over if that's suitable to you. Uh, I'm here for you. I'm honored to be anytime I can be with Murray and all these. And I looked at the participant. I guess I looked at the participant list and, and I kind of my blood pressure shot up because you are the this is the all star crew. I really feel like I should be in the back of the room, not stuck up here. So I'm honored to spend any time with any of you. Uh, it's, it's really humbling. So thank you. There, there's definitely a murderer's row of uh, of horror scholars in the participants list. I just hope they don't ask questions because I'm not that smart. Murray well, will answer all those. So, so uh, uh, one such person who has asked a question here is Stacey Abbott. Okay. And she says, what do you make of the fact that the unnamed black homeless man from the first film appears in the next two representing a resistance movement coded along class and race lines? There's a suggestion that the conclusion of the first film does perhaps have a long-term impact. No, I, I completely agree. And, I, and in the longer project, I did talk about that. And in the interest of time, I just kind of wanted to focus. I love the fact that there is a sense of that good luck as being something more. I don't feel that in the first film, but I think it is the pickup. And in the longer project, I did talk a little more about the resistance movement and a little more about their kind of hijack the media and their role in kind of violent moments in overturning it. So I do think there is a kind of resistance politics. The only thing I would say is that particularly as the film starts to feel more and more immediate, I think that actually helps to make it more immediate in part because um, the violence and rage against the system that is circulating the American culture is not only right wing, right? In fact, the start of it, what I see as start of it is decidedly multivalent in terms of politics. It is the Tea Party, which is the right of the right. It is Occupy Wall Street, which is the left of the left and the anti-system feel of the January 6th insurrection is not wholly different than the anti-system feel of the Black Lives Matter protest. So I feel like this, one of the things I really try and do in the book is to not get drawn into thinking about these affects as having political valence, but to recognize them as circulating widely. So I don't, again, in America right now, I feel like many people don't feel that the system is working. The question becomes, what do you do? And, and that's where I think exactly to Stacey's brilliant point, as always, Stacey's, uh, I told you, read her, that chapter is amazing. Um, that, the, 
the use of the homeless black man as part of the resistance that then becomes increasingly prominent, I think is absolutely crucial to thinking about the political possibilities of the film. But it's interesting that by the time we get to the forever purge, that is almost completely gone, which may be a, a critique of the way that resistance gets absorbed into the system and therefore lost. But that that's, I'll leave that for the smarter birders row to consider. I, I'm, I'm just a humble messenger. So perhaps I can call on Joe to ask his question. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely incredible talk. Um, as a huge fan of the Verge franchise and especially the second uh, TV series, which was brilliant. Um, everyone loves Max Martini. Um, yeah, my, my question is, is about this idea of radical change um, and the difference between left and right in action of it. So in, in your book, you mention uh, Cabin and Snowpiercer as, a, as films that represent the idea of radical system shutdown and radical change that could be seen uh, for, a, a way to escape capitalism and be an anti-capitalist other world that comes out of that. Um, do you think the Forever Purge maintains its post-election year nihilism by drawing on a more right extremist sort of order of the nine angles, accelerationist, there is no political solution version of a um, system shutdown? And as the echoes of the series collapse into reverberations, uh, what do you reckon that could mean for the future of the franchise? So uh, first of all, I absolutely agree. I, I think the, the, by the time we get to the forever purge, a choice has been made about what the dystopian future looks like. And so, whereas I think the first film leaves, I think powerfully, a very pessimistically ambivalent moment, right? Where the, the system is refused, which is a moral victory, but there's no possibility of political victory, albeit as, as, as Professor Abbott points out, that evolves over the, the system. I do think by the end, they have embraced this kind of radical, where I think is interesting in the politics of that to get to the, the actual question, is the use of Mexico as a safe haven, which I think Canada was also, so thanks, Murray. Uh, I'm not that far from Canada, so I'm coming to your house when it all goes down, Murray. Uh, just send your address and uh, some money so I can get there. Um, but the use of Mexico is, you know, obviously uh, it plays on, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the borderlands idea, which the brilliant talk about Dust Till Dawn uh, mentioned earlier today. Um, it also picks up on the irony, of course, the film opens with Mexican immigrants uh, sneaking across the border uh, to find a life in Texas. It ends with those same folks leading their white employers back across that. So that's kind of a political play. But I also think there may be a gesture towards international and globalization uh, or global, globalism, transnationalism. That is that the American exceptionalist myth that we are somehow chosen people, special on the hill, and you Canadians are lucky to be next to us, and those Mexicans are better be happy that we don't close the wall. That arrogance and hubris of the American century, I think, is being called out. And maybe the possibility for the future is in uh, stepping off of that pedestal and into a more global, really in the Kantian sense, cosmopolitan engagement with the world. I don't have that much hope that that's the direction American politics will go. But I do think that use of Mexico as the safe haven, and there's a great moment at the end of Forever Purge where uh, the, the, the wife of the rancher gives birth and they point out, well, now your child is a Mexican citizen, the play on the anchor baby. I think that is clearly a kind of direct poke at Trumpism, but I think it's also the suggestion of a kind of citizen of the world. And that if we want to escape from the systems of capitalism and exploitation and the ways in which the global north has exploited the global south and the precarity of climate change, and you know, the list goes on, I think there's a suggestion that the only way out of that systemic spiral into death and, and rage is through recognizing something like common humanity that exists across borders. So thank you for the question, Joe, really, really smart. Uh, so perhaps we should make uh, Lindsay Hallam's question the last one, and I'll just read it out quickly. And that's, uh, she says she wanted to know more about the effective power of the place of streaming in terms of distribution of the films. The first purge came out on Netflix in the UK during the first lockdown within a couple of weeks of the George Floyd murder. Watching at that time was incredibly uh, charged. It wasn't so much thrilling to watch as painful. Yeah, I think this is a big part of the shift. And, and it's interesting that the Forever Purge was released in a traditional theater format. So clearly at least Universal wants to stick with their old model. But I do think it's part of that, the, the moment at the end that I did not fully develop. So Craig, I'm sorry, uh, but at least I got to something together uh, was that idea of the transmedial channels and the ways in which 
bringing that into the home provides a different kind of viewing environment and also changes that historical context. And here, of course, I know uh, Stacey Abbott and, and, and Helen Wheatley and all of the amazing folks who've been working on, on uh, horror television. I've been reading your work and learning a great deal though. I'm getting to television, I'm just a little slow. So um, amazing stuff. To, but I do think it is one of those ways in which the political context uh, will continue to change as those feelings are circulating in through this new technology. And so it'll be interesting to see um, if, for instance, the Purge TV show continues or is, is renewed at some point, or if the next Purge film is engaging into more of a streaming services, if that is going to change the ways in which what is still traditionally a kind of home invasion film feels and how it engages those politics. And it's interesting to me, as last point on this, the degree to which the franchise has kept a lot of the plot points of the home invasion, but has been moving further and further away from the home. Right. From the purge through anarchy, which is mainly the streets of Los Angeles. By the time we get to the first purge, it's the entire Staten Island. And then we get to the forever purge. And now it is a race across South Texas. So we're seeing that kind of home being decentered as a space of safety, which I think in, in interesting ways may interact with streaming uh, as, as a kind of new mode of, of engagement. So, I, but I, I would love to hear Lindsay, I'm sure Professor Hallam would talk much more intelligently. So I'll, I'll look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you all and buying you a pint and you can tell me all the things that I didn't get right or that you could add to this because I'm always a student of your wisdom. All right, I guess that probably, um, that probably should do it for our question section. Thank you again, Kendall, for uh, for so uh, so admirably uh, addressing all of those numerous and varied points. And he tried, folks. Should... He tried. He gave it a best shot. <laughs> no, no, more than that.